This is Boys on the Roof by Kirsten Chen, who is right there, incidentally. She's great. The neighbors are on the roof again. It's Friday afternoon and warm for the end of October, so I'm not surprised. Pulling my cord into the driveway, I watch out the window. Jimmy and the loud one they call Pooch are busy unfolding chairs. Then Tucker, the lanky, shy one with eyelashes so pale they look dusted with snowflakes, passes up a boombox, bags of chips and pretzels, multiple cases of beer. They work efficiently, like members of an assembly line. When Craig and I moved after getting married last year, living in a neighborhood crammed with UC Davis undergrads wasn't at the top of our list. But we both have graduate school loans to pay off and we were sick of living in apartments. This way we could afford a two-bedroom house with a patch of yellow grass around the back. And since we've discovered I'm two months pregnant, forgotten birth control pills on a weekend trip to Napa, we have all the more reason to be frugal. The possibility of terminating the pregnancy was discussed and then dismissed. And now with the initial shock fading like a bruise, Craig has begun to get excited. He's the one who picked up the phone and called our families, the one who brought home a copy of the mother of all pregnancy books, the ultimate guide to conception, birth, and everything in between. We got the conception part right without any help. What do we need that for, I asked. Craig wouldn't speak to me the rest of the night. The boys next door are friendly and polite. Sometimes it's just the three of them on top of the flat stucco one story, and early in the summer, Craig even climbed up there and had a beer. Other times, their friends' cars form an endless line down our street, and we find ourselves wishing for cooler weather. Tonight's looks like it's going to be a big one. At six, Craig returns from the architecture firm. In the kitchen, while I toss spinach leaves with olive oil and vinegar and a little lemon juice, I hear him talking to the boys. Come have a beer, Pooch says. Bring Karen, says Jimmy. Some other time, Craig calls back. You kids have fun. As he comes through the door, I say, Karen? can no longer consume alcohol, or caffeine, or shellfish for that matter. I banned Craig from using our coffee pot. Once I joked that the sound of percolating water was enough to make me want to change my mind and was rewarded with another evening of stony glares. Craig's arms encircle a large cardboard box and he's grinning from ear to ear. White noise machine, he says, $24.99 at Target, in case it stays warm for the month. In spite of myself, and lean over and kiss him on the mouth. After dinner, we decide to watch a movie recommended by a teacher I work with at the high school, an independent film about 13-year-olds using drugs and having sex. As Craig fiddles with the DVD player, I peer out the window. The roof of the house is packed with kids. Their bodies press up against each other as they laugh and yell and gyrate to a thumping beat. We turn up the volume to drown out the noise. The film is dark and disturbing, and sometimes I look away. We watch in silence, and when it's over, I say, I want to lock my students in a classroom and never let them out again. I rest my hands to my belly. It seems to have grown in the last hour. It's a movie, Craig says. They have to exaggerate so people will watch. I want them to stop being so flippant. You know what's scary, I say? They were pretty good parents, and the kids still got fucked up. Then we hear a crash next door, followed by shouts and screams over the still pounding music. Outside, a boy tells us Pooch fell while peeing off the roof. Kids form a wall around him, blocking my view. Beside me, two girls start to cry, and a third throws up in the hedge by the door. Craig pushes his way through the crowd, and I catch a glimpse of Pooch on his back, eyes squeezed shut, mouth a cavernous, gasping hole. Call an ambulance, Craig yells. Somebody call an ambulance. I don't notice Tucker until he grabs my arm, his face shining with tears. Should we call his mom? I don't want to scare her. He was really wasted. He might have broken his legs. Maybe his back. God, I hope he's okay. I reach up and pat his shoulder. I know I should tell him his friend will be fine, but I say nothing. By the time the EMTs leave with Pooch, the kids have dispersed and the line of cars shrinks steadily. Craig piles Jimmy and Tucker into our accord, neither of them fit to drive themselves to the hospital. Back inside, I wait on the couch. I picture Craig with the boys telling them things to calm them down. Unlike me, he always knows exactly what to say. My belly rises and falls beneath my hands, and for a moment I think I feel a heartbeat. Then I realize it's only my own, reverberating like a voice in space. 